titles already. This has got to be my favorite video topic ever. Like ever. Like I've been thinking about this for a long time because today we are talking about the Enneagram types of the cast of Gilmore Girls. If you're I'm Abby Howe and I'm here to help you discover you. For more videos about the Enneagram and personality types, make sure to subscribe to this channel for new videos every week. Now, let's start with everyone's favorite bookworm, Rory Gilmore. Who cares if I'm pretty if I fail my finals? My best book. Uh-huh, what's the Faulkner? My other best book. There you go. Rory's defining trait is her pursuit of knowledge. She always has a book. She works so hard to get into an Ivy League school. She's super curious, always asking questions, always exploring. That's why I think that she is an Enneagram 5, the investigator. One major aspect of the Enneagram 5 is that they tend to observe over participate. So they can appear to be loners and they can often just watch life from the sidelines. I think with Rory, we see this observation over participation a lot, but I especially think it's on display within her relationship with Paris. Paris is such a doer and Rory just follows along. For example, when Paris is running for student body president at Chilton, Rory is roped into being vice president because Paris needs someone to bring up her likability. But Rory, when, when Paris approaches Rory about this, Rory's just sitting there reading. She's not actively fighting for this role at all. It probably didn't even enter her head. She probably knows everything about how the Chilton student body president operates and how the vice president operates. She probably has lots of ideas, but she prefers to observe. It is Paris, this incredible like go-getter doer, who brings this Enneagram 5 into the fold and makes her participate. And even after Rory is elected vice president, she mostly stays silent during student body meetings. She prefers to influence Paris's decisions from the sidelines. I also thought this was indicative when Paris forces Rory to be Juliet in the play. And Rory vehemently does not want to do this, and part of that might have been Tristan, but I think she just in general doesn't want to be in the spotlight. She certainly doesn't want to be the lead character in this play. And even then, even when she was Juliet, she had no lines. Or they didn't show any of the lines, like when Romeo dies and she wakes up. All Rory did was lay on a table and get kissed by people, which is so annoying and just Ugh. A basic fear of the Enneagram 5 is being incompetent or ignorant. I think that this is a huge fear in Rory's life, which is why she works so hard to know things. I think this is shown when Lorelai and Rory go on a spontaneous road trip after Lorelai breaks up with Max and Rory cannot handle the spontaneity. She sneaks maps in the car. She's trying to like plan this trip meticulously. She just, she cannot handle the feeling of being unprepared. What did that sign say? It said, don't, or death on it. Max, we're doomed. Wrong, we're being guided by fate. I think we're lost. Another defining trait of the Enneagram 5 is their ability to compartmentalize. I think that this is a defense mechanism against feelings of overwhelm and loss of control. Fives tend to assign categories to their families, their relationships, their jobs, their hobbies, in order to determine how much energy each activity is going to take. This can manifest in a five keeping their cards close to the chest. I mean, why would you tell one category of your life about another category of your life? And it just, just, if you keep them separate, you can conserve your energy. We see this in the way that Rory separates her school life with her life in Stars Hollow. When Paris wants to do a newspaper article about Stars Hollow, Rory gets visibly upset. She just does not want those two worlds to blend. I think I got rabies. It's just a bus, Paris. It smelled. It smelled like a bus. Overall, I think that Rory finds a healthy balance between participating and observing, and she learns to embrace her depth of knowledge in her studies. Ultimately, she sees herself as part of her environment rather than separate from everyone and everything. Next, I'm exploring diner owner and baseball cap lover Luke Danes. Same stupid group comes in here and take up all my tables and every chair they can get their sticky hands on, and they do that. They sit, they stand, one person holds a kid, another person holds a kid. Will you marry me? What? Just looking for something to shut you up. 
Port. That's ridiculous. They're in position and ready for the installation at your say so. No, you can't do this. It's an invasion of privacy. Luke's defining trait is his desire of stability and security. He greatly values his life staying the same. He even keeps his dad's hardware store pretty much intact, even though he turns it into a diner. This is why I think that Luke is an Enneagram 6, the loyalist. I think the best way to show Luke's skeptical nature of new and unknown things is his relationship with Taylor. Taylor is always always wanting to change things, and Luke is constantly fighting against the unpredictability of change. You want to open up the soda shop in the space next to the diner? It's the only one that's appropriate. Taylor, no, 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 no. And every day, from now on till the end of my life, I am going to come in here and say, Taylor, no. Sixes are the most dependable people on the Enneagram. I love when Luke is fighting with Max or bickering with Max over Lorelai, and he says, Doesn't matter what time it is. I'll always be around. The core weakness of the Enneagram 6 is fearing fear itself. This causes anxiety because you're constantly trying to fix everything. And I think we see this with Luke a lot. Luke, you could have broken your neck. No, it would have been all right if I had. I would have fixed it because that's what I do. I fix things, even when I don't want to be fixed. I think this is why Luke ends up being so valuable for Jess. Jess needed a stable, solid parental figure, and Luke stepped up to the challenge. What develops between them is a really sweet friendship, and I think that's because of Luke's ability to be authentic and honest and reliable, and he's a really good judge of character. I'm here, Jess. I'm always here. Thanks. And now on to the indomitable Emily Gilmore. Better yet, throw the old harpy's carcass in a ditch. Let a wolverine eat her. No, a Nazi that we knew. I'd forgotten. We stayed with him once in Munich. Nice old man. Interesting story. Then buy me a boa and drive me to Reno because I am open for business. Emily is so incredibly strong and her core desire on the show is protecting herself and her family. You see her struggling to maintain control over her surroundings and others and she fights tooth and nail to take care of her tribe. That's why I think that Emily Gilmore is an Enneagram 8, the challenger. Even though Emily is often an antagonist for Rory and Lorelai, when it really comes down to it, she fights for those girls. And nobody can verbally eviscerate someone like Emily Gilmore. <laughs> well, let me tell you this year, we are just as good as you are. You don't think Rory is good enough for your son as if we don't know Logan's reputation? We do. But he is welcome in our home anytime, and you should extend the same courtesy to Rory. Emily, now let's talk about your money. You were a two-bit gold digger fresh off the bus from Hicksville when you met Mitchum at whatever bar you happened to stumble into. Emily's core fear is being weak, powerless, and vulnerable. That's why I think she put so much energy in having control. I believe that's why she was so controlling with Lorelai when Lorelai was growing up, and it comes full circle when Rory moves into her grandparents' pool house. When your father gets home, we're going to talk about the house rules and be on the same page once and for all. You mean my grandfather? You know what I meant. Even though Emily has a really tough exterior, underneath all of that stuff, there is a tender, loving wife, grandma, and mother. I personally believe that the only good part of Gilmore Girls A Year in the Life was seeing Emily transform after Richard's passing. Her whole life, Emily has resisted vulnerability because she thinks it makes her weak. But when she finally opens up, Emily shows herself to be understanding, diplomatic, and an amazing champion for other people. And now on to a controversial character, but my personal favorite male lead on the show, Jess Mariano. I was attacked by a swan, okay? You happy? A stupid swan. I'll help you practice, okay? Tomorrow, you'll stand in the middle of the street, and I will drive straight at you, screaming in a foreign language. I am not going back to school. So that's it? Yeah, that's it. Jess's defining trait is his desire to be unique, special, and authentic. He rejects the ordinary, embraces melancholy, and just walks around the town like feeling like something is really lacking within him. That's why I believe that Jess is an Enneagram 4, the romantic. As Jess seeks his significance in the world, he is searching for belonging. The great dichotomy of an Enneagram 4 is that they really want to belong, but they also don't want to be like everyone else. So I think that Jess came to Stars Hollow just really hurting and really wanting a community and some, somewhere to belong, but his inner foreness just is not letting him do that because the town is so, um, everyone's so conforming there that it's just this like great, like 
hurt with him because he wants to belong, but he doesn't want to belong, and it's just, just all a mess. That doesn't sound very convincing. Look, what exactly do you want from me? You bring me here to this place, you put me in a school that says the Pledge of Allegiance in six different languages, two of which I've never heard of before. You take me away from my home, my friends, and now you want what from me? I'm trying to help you. Well, stop trying. Stop talking to me, stop following me, and stop asking me questions. Just stop. That's what you want? Yes. That's really what you want? Yes. Fine, you got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Like a four, Jess is drawn to the offbeat and the artistic side of life. He loves books and music, and one of my favorite scenes is when he writes in the margins of a book he borrowed from Rory. Jess is a deep thinker who can be self-centered and dramatic, but he is so romantic and passionate. I love you. Ultimately, Jess grows into a healthy four. He still has his vast emotional range, but he's not so tied to his feelings where he's up and down all of the time. He has found a way to live outside of his shame and hurt, and he remains deeply connected to his artistic side and his authenticity. Now let's talk about the Gilmore girl you've all been waiting for, Lorelai Gilmore. I smell snow. Does he have a motorcycle? Because if you're gonna throw your life away, he better have a motorcycle. This is a jumbo coffee morning. I need coffee and an IV. Lorelai is constantly seeking happiness. She's always looking for new possibilities and experiences. I believe that Lorelai desires contentment and freedom, which is why I think she's an Enneagram 7, the enthusiast. An Enneagram 7's core fear is of being in physical, emotional, or mental pain. They really don't want to be deprived. And I think that we see this in Lorelai's relationship with her parents. She was so constricted in that house with her parents growing up that when she finally got pregnant and felt like she just couldn't take it anymore, she fled and she ran away and she tried to get out of that deprivation and that like suffocating environment that she was in. I also think that she parents like this as well. Part of what makes her a great mom is she doesn't want Rory to be caged like she was. So she gives Rory a lot of opportunity to grow and become her own person without tons of restrictions. Maybe. With Jess. <laughs> With Jess. You still want me to tell you everything, right? Yeah. Uh, no. Way I... <laughs> Which is it? We're doing this now. Yes? Which is it? I don't know. You'll let me know? Yeah. Was that, yeah, you'll let me know, or yeah, that's your answer, you want to know? I guess I want to know, yes. Okay. And now. Sure. Sevens can struggle with commitment. They really don't like to be tied down with long-term options that limit their flexibility. I think that we see this in Lorelai with the way that she deals with romantic relationships. And to me, the most glaring example of her fear of commitment is in her relationship with Max. Even though they were in love, even though I think they could have made that marriage a happy one, as the wedding gets closer and closer, Lorelai just freaks out. She cannot stomach the loss of freedom. Pack everything, traveling light is for girls. What's going on here? Why are we hitting the road? We haven't taken a road trip in forever and the weather is perfect. We can't take a road trip. You're getting married this weekend. You have my blue swimsuit. What about Max? Sunscreen, we need sunscreen. Mom, stop. What? Are you and Max getting married? No. Another defining trait of the Enneagram 7 is their ability to look on the bright side. When Lorelai is confronted with a problem, she either runs away or becomes the ultimate spin doctor. She tries to turn a negative situation into a positive in order to avoid feeling any pain. I think that this is demonstrated when Lorelai decides to keep the huppa that Luke made her for her canceled wedding. I, uh, I think I'm gonna keep it. What? Yeah. It's beautiful. You made it for me, and it doesn't have to be a wedding huppa. It can just be a beautiful archway in our yard. I'll grow stuff on it. Well, okay. Ultimately, Lorelai learns how to embrace suffering rather than run from it. She finds love and commitment with Luke while also staying super fun and adventurous. She's still the core of Lorelai, but she's a little bit more spiritually grounded and resilient. And finally, we're talking about Richard Gilmore, played by the late and great Edward Herman. Dad, 
Lorelei, Rory. And I went in there every morning for three years, and I had the most dreadful breakfast. It's just awful. <laughs> Only prostitutes have two glasses of wine at lunch. I believe that Richard is motivated by a desire to live life the right way. He is ethical, dedicated, and reliable, and he greatly wants to avoid any kind of blame. That's why I think that Richard Gilmore is an Enneagram One, AKA the perfectionist. Richard has an extremely high set of expectations for himself and for other people. I think that this is why he is constantly criticizing Lorelei. Is that your second cup of coffee? Uh, third. Why? No reason. It's a lot of coffee first thing in the morning. When she got pregnant and refused to marry Christopher, he was absolutely shocked because in his eyes, there was a black and white, right and wrong way to handle that situation and she did the wrong thing. Richard is also an extremely hard worker. Even though he sometimes falls into the trap of workaholism, he always rises to the challenge of getting the job done. For example, when he quits his insurance job to start his own company, he works dutifully until it succeeds. Though Richard had many shortcomings as a father, he was ultimately committed to a life of service and integrity. He was a loving grandpa to and a devoted husband to Emily. It's your turn now. Tell me what you think the cast of the Gilmore Girls is, and please tell me what you think Suki is, because I almost put her in this video, but I just couldn't decide what she was. So tell me what you think she is, and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. I put out new videos every single week all about the Enneagram and helping you discover you. Thanks so much for watching. As always, have a lovely, lovely day. Toodles.